in every kind of institution, whether it's the family, whether it's the government, whether it's the church, whether it's a business, whatever it may be, there are codes of conduct, there are regulations, there are laws, and people are expected to abide by those things. And if those companies, or whatever they may be, are to be successful, things will be done decently in order, which implies a standard to live by. But then if those standards are violated, there's always some form of corrective discipline. Always that way. And where a standard of conduct is ignored or just as it was said of Israel of old, there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Whether it's that kind of thing or whatever it may be, then there is anarchy and the breakdown of law and order. and Things do not simply function as they ought to. Well, when you read about ancient fleshly Israel, you see those problems there. But when you come over to the kingdom of Christ, the church, the spiritual body of Christ, the family of God, you see that there is a perfect law of liberty whereby we're to live. You can call it a code of conduct. You can call it a divine standard. Any other terms that connote that idea to us. But in studying it, you not only see the importance of preventive discipline, that is, learning how we're to live, learning how God wants us to live, how we're to deal with one another in the kingdom, how we're even to deal with people in the world who have not become Christians and not going to. Then we're expected to, with those who are members of the church, who go astray, as we want to say, who are disorderly, who teach false doctrine or else their lives are immoral, whatever they might be that causes them to transgress God's will, then there's corrective discipline involved there. Now, if God did not love us enough to send his son to save us from our sins through all the things that he did, then he wouldn't love us enough to give us that perfect, which means complete, for what God intended it to be, law of liberty. And he wouldn't have taught in that law of liberty corrective discipline for the members who choose, once knowing the truth, to go another direction. People may say, well, God's a loving God, but what they think of as love many times is, is that he's a... A God who permits everything. If you nag at him enough, you can get away with anything. and He'll still accept you because you're such a loving, gracious God. That's not taught in the scriptures. Nowhere is that taught in the scriptures. However, it's very easy for people to practice that. And it's really a form of respect of persons. But when you look into the Bible, and again we look back in the Old Testament, we see that while men may disagree with one another over opinions and likes and dislikes or whatever, then the Bible tells us how we tolerate those things. But what about when men disagree with God? They have His will, they understand it, but they do as they please. Or maybe they live by it for a while and then simply walk away from it. What's our attitude as faithful members of the church, what is our disposition of mind, our attitude, our belief then concerning such matters? Well, the attitude of many members of the Lord's church uh, today and has for a, a long time, it, it just amazes me because of the things I already said by way of introduction. You'll hear things like, well, surely... Surely, brother, whoever it is, 
would ever be a false teacher. And people seem to be aghast that one could think a fellow member of the body of Jesus Christ could teach false doctrine. But let me ask you something. As you read your New Testament after the church was established and as the whole New Testament was being revealed, do you have anything said about being aware and careful of those who would teach a perverted gospel? Certainly you do. You do every way you look. There's always been false teachers among God's people. The apostle wrote, but there were false prophets also among the people, speaking of fleshly Israel. And then notice how straightforward this is. Even as there shall be false teachers among you. 2 Peter 2 verse 1. And you remember... The inspired Apostle Paul's statement to the Ephesian elders, whom he loved so very dearly and had labored so much among them with great sacrifice, notice how solid he is on what he says. He said to those elders, I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you. He says, not sparing the flock, then he aims directly at the eldership. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. I doubt you hear the word pervert or perverse used much anymore because it is politically incorrect. If you were to call certain people who were in violation of God's law, whether it be having to do with religious false doctrine or moral error, and if you were to stand up in some places and say, that's perverted or you're living a perverted life, there's no telling what might happen to you nowadays. But nevertheless, the Bible says, let that sink in. God's infallible word says, and on the day of judgment, when every person comes before the judgment seat of Christ, it'll still read just like I read it. There are perverse things. There's perverted religious matters. There's perverted moral matters. The fact that a teacher is eloquent, very well learning, does not mean he's accurate or right. If a friend, well, that's no proof he's factual. Being a fine, good handshaker, good mixer doesn't prove he's teaching the truth. And even if his sincerity is no uh, guarantee, even his sincerity is no guarantee that he's speaking as the oracles of God, which the Apostle Peter commanded us to do, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. Our Lord in his earthly ministry, in preparing the apostles and all those around him, was vaccinating those people against the day after the church was established that people would teach a false doctrine. And he said, beware of false prophets. Well, if there's not any false uh, Prophets, this is, this is empty, worthless language. If there are no false prophets, what's there to beware of? But Jesus said, beware of false prophets. And how do they come? Well, they come in sheep's clothing. But what are they really? But inwardly, their true selves, they are ravening wolves. They're there to destroy, not build up. Well, now, was he just talking about other groups? and not his disciples or the Lord's church. And then there's the apostle of love, the apostle John in his warning. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or prove the spirits whether they are of God. Because many, not some or a few, or nine then, but many false prophets are gone out into the world, 1 John 4, 1. Mind you, these words are written as the New Testament is being written in the first century before it's ever completed, and he's telling the brethren this. 
The inclination to believe everything and everybody is neither godly or sensible. Today, I don't know how we can escape the truth of what Isaiah said of the people of his day in Isaiah 5 and verse 20, where the people are calling evil good and good evil. Well, that's on every side of it. And the prophet in chapter 8 of the book of Isaiah in verse 20 had this to say, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, well, what is it? It is because there is no light in them. Now, language couldn't be clearer. The idea of investigation is found in God's commendation of the Bereans and other places too. But I think of Acts 17, 11 now. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they receive the word with all readiness of mind. And what did they do? They searched the scriptures daily. That means they examined them, whether these things were so. Well, if we're really interested in pleasing God, we won't be blinded by friendship, by family, by glad-handing, by eloquence, by high formal education or whatever. Our interest will be to search the scriptures, to learn how to ascertain the Lord's authority, for we seek his authority for all our beliefs and actions. We'll learn how to examine everything that goes on to see whether it's according to the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And we'll have a willing mind that hungers and thirsts after righteousness to give up or take on, whichever is the case may be, whatever, to be obedient to the Lord. We want to know the message of salvation. We want to understand it. We want to apply it. You just don't play house with God. We have one time through this life. And we don't ever know when that time's going to end. But when it does end, there's no more chance to change. No more opportunity to repent. Whether you live here 20 years, 15 years, I, you think of the people a year ago that were 15 years old and they never thought of their 16th birthday. Or whether it's 30, 40, 50, 60, wherever you want to put it, it comes to an end. And with that end, there's no more opportunity to change. And it has to be a complete change. You can't say, you know, you can't say, well, God, I'll... I'll try this here, and then if that works, I'll move over and get rid of this. There is the resolve on the part of a truly penitent person, Acts 17, 30, that I will no longer, to the best of my ability, ever sin again. Now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to say, well, I, I'm not a sinner, in the sense of I'll never sin again. But it means that's your resolve and your goal is set on that, and I promise you, until that attitude is there, John says, I'm writing these things to you that you sin not. Then you will never progress if you don't have the goal that I am not going to sin anymore. Then that makes you very aware that when you have that thought in your mind that's against the truth because you now study, you see, to learn the Lord's will. You study and you study and you study. When you quit studying, then you quit living. And then you start seeing what you'll never see otherwise. Then some people will come along and say, well, we're not to judge. You know, some things just get old. Because when a person says we're not to judge, he's judging. That's what he's doing. He's judging you. And somebody that ignorant needs help, needs a lot of help. And that's a common so-called attempt at defending false teachers is to say, don't judge me. Don't judge them. Who are you? You don't know. Are you perfect? Well, it's true that Jesus said, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not. But he explained himself on that. Here's what he said. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam that's in thine own eye. 
and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that's in thy brother's eye. Verse 5. Did you notice? There's a need for one brother to cast out the mote of the other brother's eye when it's there. The problem is, is that these folks were trying to do something with other folks when they were not qualified and weren't living right themselves. That's the kind of judgment that he's talking about. John 7, 24 makes it very clear that you can't be faithful to God and go to heaven if you don't judge righteous judgment. Here's a judgment that's prohibited. Here's a judgment that is obligatory and necessary. So to apply Matthew 7, 1 to the action of examining teachers to see whether they teach the truth or not is simply to pervert the passage. And it will deny many others. First of all, the apostles and Jesus himself opposed those that taught false doctrine. When the apostle Paul had to deal with the case of a sinful brother at Corinth, the Holy Spirit had him write this. He said, I've judged already. Well, I thought we weren't supposed to judge at all. Well, you see how he's judged. We make those judgments all the time if we're godly. We know when something godly when it's not. If it's not godly, we judge it. It's not godly. If it's godly, we judge it godly. We don't want to be found calling evil good and good evil. Then he said to the Christians after saying, I've judged already, do not ye judge them that are within? Then look at what his conclusion is concerning the sinner he was talking about. Put away from among yourselves that wicked person. 1 Corinthians 5, 3. Verses 12 through 13. I would suggest to you, strongly suggest to you, out of what the Bible teaches and human nature and your own experience, people, and I know my own experience among the brethren, this, is, this lack of application of what Paul says here in Corrected Discipline of the Church is going to send a whole lot of folks to torment. We'll just let people get by with certain things and we'll do a thing in the world about it. But beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. A person tells you they're a Christian, they love God, but they don't keep his commandments. I know what they are. If they're telling you they love God and don't keep his commandments, then they're a hypocrite. They're not telling the truth any way you go about it. It's just that God demands faithful obedience to his truth. And he puts the responsibility on us to discern that truth and to know whether people are living in harmony with it, for by their fruits you shall know them. Now, let me ask you, can you find anywhere in Old or New Testament where God ever promises to bless somebody who violates his will? No, you can't. It's just not there. It's right the opposite. But there will be those that come along and will ignore marking false teachers and avoiding them. We've got the idea that if you avoid somebody, you hate them, you want to see their destruction. But that's not what the Bible says. What are we going to do in the case of a teacher who teaches false doctrine and refuses to be corrected and repent? Well, maybe he's a very good friend. So you just sort of overlook it and don't say much about it. Maybe you somewhere or the other learn better. And don't tell me that attitude is not in the body of Christ. It has been for a long time. I don't think it's going to disappear. But I know one thing, that those who hold it and practice it are never going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant at the judgment. You're just not going to. Because you're not a faithful servant. Only the faithful servants here, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The Lord's not going to make a mistake. Now, of course, if he's not a good friend, people will say, well, we don't want to, we don't want to smear his name by publicly branding him with every rumor we hear about him. Well, no, we're talking about rumors. We're talking about proof by the fruit born that a person is or is not what they claim to be. I remember years ago when some efforts were made, and this is a long time ago, I was just a boy, wasn't even preaching, but I remember it being said by 
of certain elders that when they wanted to try to correct this one member, one of the elders got up and said, well, look, he shows up now and then at worship. Uh, we don't want to kill whatever little faith he's got. Well, evidently a lot of <laughs> families feel that way about disciplining their children. And that's the reason this country's in the most wonderful state it could ever hope to be in today, isn't it? And the home is such a wonderful place. And marriage and divorce or remarriage, as the Bible teaches, respect it. Why, well, it's not. It's getting worse every day. And it's because people won't pay attention to the standard God gave. They don't care about it. They oppose it. They outright attack it. And they justify living contrary to it. Even if, even if they don't live that way themselves, they justify it can be that way then with the Lord's church, and it is too often. These attitudes are, are shameful for anybody professing to be a faithful follower of Christ. Wouldn't it be just the simple thing to do what the Scriptures teach? That's not hard to understand. So the problem is not with understanding. The problem is... We just don't want to do it. We just don't want to do it. With concern for the soul, we need to work with people. And when I say work with people, taking each one in their own given circumstances and ability and lack of it, and teach them. You remember when... And this was a grown man who was very devoted, very capable, very eloquent, a preacher. Apollos was his name, but he wasn't correct in what he taught. And when the husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla, heard him preach, they recognized by the fruit he bore in his preaching that he knew only the baptism of John. Well, that sent a signal, didn't it? And they took him aside. And taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. Acts 18.26 When one errs from the truth, James 5.19 When he does that today At least if he's in the situation Apollos was in Shouldn't we take him aside and teach him? Shouldn't we talk to them? taking them where we find them and going forward. As Paul told Timothy in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Anybody opposing themselves today by claiming one thing and living another way? And he says, here's what, it's, what he said later in this verse, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. So this false teacher, that's what he is. He's a false teacher because he teaches a lie. Is his soul worth saving to? Is the church worth protecting from somebody like this, whether they repent or not? Of course, if they persist in the error, they reject all overtures of faithful members to get them to repent. Here's what Jesus had to say concerning the Ephesians. In the letter in Revelation, Revelation 2 and verse 2, he says that they had tried them that say they are apostles and they are not, has found them false. Now you can call it what you want to, that was a church trial. People came along saying, We're apostles like Paul and Peter and others and John. They said, If you are, and here's one way they could have very well tried them. If you're an apostle, you have the miraculous signs of an apostle, which they wouldn't have. Paul had no problem at all in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 12, of saying, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. And the Lord commends them for saying, Well, they say one thing, that was a big lie. They wanted the authority the apostles had, and they put them to the test. Well, nowadays, if you put somebody to the test, you're thought to be the meanest thing to ever walk the earth, so unloving and trying to run people off. That's been for a long time in the Lord's church, and thus they're going to lose their souls over that. 
But you see the same thing taught by Paul, Romans 16, 17, just finished under Ken's teaching, the book of Romans. In verse 17, Paul said in closing out that letter to the church there, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. He didn't say offenses and divisions because you didn't like the color tunic you wore. He says contrary to the doctrine, to the teaching. What did he say do? Avoid them. Well, what is it to avoid something? You ever go down a road and avoid a pothole? Well, you straddle it and try to go around it. You don't go running through it. And if you didn't see it and you do hit it, you sure don't like it. Man, same thing be true if you had a rattlesnake turn loose in your backyard and you didn't know where it was. Would you let the kids play in the backyard? Yeah, they've just been waiting all day long to play in the backyard, and I don't want to disappoint them. That's the way people think. But people will talk about what I'm saying here as being too harsh. And we notice Second John verses 9 through 11 this morning. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. You may say, well, I don't believe what he teaches. I'm just showing Christian hospitality. Well, they don't let him in your house. You remember a long time ago, maybe some of you won't remember this, but that's when we had screen doors that weren't air conditioned. Mama get us out tight, she'd hook the screen door, we couldn't get in. Make us stay outside. Well, just hook the screen door against false teachers. They don't need to be in. Let them go out and do something else. I remember one time in the overcup outside of Moralton, Arkansas, there was a Jehovah's Witness coming through the community and came to one of the members' house, and they called me. So I went out there, and he was there, and we had a pretty good uh, round right there in the house in the sense of discussion. So he said, well, he had to leave. I said, where are you going? Well, I'm going over on down. I said, you don't mind if I go with you, do you? <laughs> so I traveled with him for two or three houses until he decided that it wasn't worth having me along. <laughs> well, I thought I had an obligation. This guy's out here showing false doctrine in these houses. They'll let him in. Maybe they'll let me in. Of course, we were standing there at the door together when he knocked, and I just went in when they let him in. Nobody said any difference. So we end up having a discussion as it could develop there. You want something to do? There's stuff to do. There's stuff to do. We cannot in any way set forth an example by our conduct of condoning error or people who live contrary to the truth. If we can we can stop right now and say, is it clear? What does the Bible teach on this? We cannot be a partaker of error. If we by silence allow error to be taught, and the Bible says we basically have become guilty as if we were actually teaching it. We have to understand that their mouths must be stopped. That's what the Bible says. God has given us reasons for marking the teacher of error. And remember, after he had told Timothy to shun profane babbling, Paul gives the results of that kind of teaching. Their word will eat as doth a canker, a gangrene, and overthrow the faith of some. 2 Timothy 3, or 2, verses 16 through 18. You have the same thing found in Romans 16, 17, and 18. Mark and avoid them again. Because they employ good words and fair speeches, and they beguile or deceive the hearts of the simple or the innocent. In short, it comes down to this. The influence of teachers of error must not be allowed to destroy the faith of members of Christ's church. And each one of us, his brothers and sisters in Christ, have an obligation to our brethren to learn the Bible well enough, first of all, to know what our duty is individually, and then learn how to help our brethren. When God gave the qualifications of elders in Titus 
chapter 1. He stated last, holding to the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayer. For there are many unruly and vain talkers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths, it's not optional, folks, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. Is that still applicable today? Of course it is. Yes, we must be long-suffering with people. We must deal with each case on its own merits. But if somebody begins to teach error and won't repent while we're working with them, they certainly don't need to be in a position of teaching. They certainly don't need to be in a leadership capacity. So we must be concerned about the souls of others and because that's about the best way I can be concerned like I ought to be about my own soul. You'll find that you won't be so much concerned about your own soul when you've never learned to be very concerned about the souls of others. So we need to look for purity of doctrine. Do all we can teach the brethren the importance of it. And then we need to deal with these false teachers and people who aren't living right just exactly the way the Bible says. Under the guise of love and patience and time to rethink the issue, false teachers have been allowed to continue in their, in their teaching. These are perilous times. You can talk about the world around about us, matters pertaining to nations and other nations and how we're dealing with one another. But we have for a long time been in very perilous times regarding the purity of the church. We're being bombarded not only without but from within by a wide assortment of doctrinal errors. People aren't thankful. People aren't mindful of emphasizing doctrine. They make light of it. But I don't know of any way to become a Christian without the doctrine of Christ. And I don't know of any way to do anything in service to God without the doctrine of Christ. I don't know how to preach without the doctrine of Christ. I don't know how to worship God in spirit and in truth without the doctrine of Christ. I don't know how to live my life day by day as a living sacrifice without the doctrine of Christ. If anybody show me how you do that, uh, then I'd like to know. But I don't think you can because the first thing you'd probably do is try to open the doctrine of Christ to show me. That book reads now and means now just what it'll read when we stand before Christ in judgment. So let's order our lives according to it. And whatever repenting needs to be done from those things that are handicapping us, then let's be honest with God. He knows already our situation and truly repent of our sins. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, don't listen to false teachers who tell you that you can just be saved by faith only. It won't work. The only time faith only is mentioned in the New Testament is that salvation is not by faith only in James 2. The faith that saves has always been the faith that obeys, Hebrews 5, verse 9, Hebrews 11. So if you have an interest, a genuine, true heart interest to turn your life around, your mind, your thinking, your purposing, to make radical changes and sacrificial changes, to be different, as the Bible defines difference of members of the church and the world, then you're, you're ready to obey the gospel, believing in him, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being baptized into him for the remission of sins. Or as a child of God, have you got yourself wound up in the affairs of this present world? Well, if so, you're going to have to give them up. You can't be acceptable to the faithful people of God because no one's acceptable to God except they be faithful. And faithful members of the church can't accept anybody God won't accept. And we better accept everybody God will accept. But we don't accept people who won't obey the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Now, if you can find something in the doctrine of Christ 
that refutes what I just said, I would really appreciate somebody show me. But now we offer the invitation. So we ask you to come to Christ if you need while we stand and while we sing.